Praise the Lord. Church, I said, praise the Lord. We are coming to a close at this time of this special retreat, the final solution retreat. And Jesus will be the final solution in your life. As the Lord has declared unto us, He has come to solve our problem. I want to say that word, Amen, is a sacred word. It's not an ordinary word. And it is given in response to the promise of a supernatural God. And when we say Amen, it is not to displease God, distrust God, disdain God, belittle God, have our way. We don't take a sacred word and turn it into something that is of self-will. It's like blasphemy. So, when you say amen, you say that amen with the consciousness that this is sacred. And you are not using the word like drunkards use religious words because they are drunk. Amen. It's, God bless you. It's a sacred word. There will be an amen in your life. A fulfillment in your life. Now tonight, you have to be patient. Any patient brother there? Any patient sister there? You'll be patient. Because we're getting to the end and the close of the retreat. And the Lord has been talking about what He wants to do for us, what He promises us. He's turning it around now. He's saying, This is what I expect from you. We must not be like children that when we're getting and getting and getting, then we're nice. We're cheerful, we're happy, and then when daddy or mommy says, Now, my boy, now, my daughter, learn to give, and then the daughter or the son becomes unhappy, I only want to get, I only want to get, I don't want to give, that will not be right. We're faithful children of God. And tonight, we're going to go through the Word of God and see what He expects of you and what He expects of me, the first faith and the first love. God make you an obedient child. Yeah. Father, we well, thank you tonight. We come to this session now. Where well, you reveal your mind, your heart unto us as to what we ought to render unto the Lord in our first love and first faith. We're asking, Lord, that our life, our heart, our soul, our mind will align with your word in Jesus' name. All that you have done, all that you have given, all that you have provided, we want to have a chance to respond unto you and to give ourselves unreservedly unto you. We're asking tonight, we'll be such children in Jesus' name. 
your demand will not go unnoticed. And your hold on us in everything we have will not go unrecognized in Jesus' name. Have your way. Have your will. And let your word take root in every life in Jesus' name. We'll discover the first phase will render it back to you. Amen. We'll discover the first love will render it back to you. Amen. We'll discover the first seal will render it back unto you. Amen. We'll remember the first commitment when we came into the kingdom will render it back to you. Amen. Speak, Lord, for your sons, your daughters, your servants are hearing. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2. We're reading from verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because... Thou hast led thy first love. Here is the Lord. Here is our King. Here is our Master. Here is the Bridegroom of the Bride. Talking to the church at Ephesus. And by extension, talking to every one of us. And he's saying, I know your works. I know your service. I know your zeal. I know your faith, I know your belief, I know your doctrine, but there's one thing I have against you. If any church is like the church at Ephesus, here today is the church deep alive. Because we're against false doctrine, like the Ephesian church, because we serve the Lord. And we do everything we can do, and we say only the best is good enough for God. We believe in real salvation, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus is Lord. We believe in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We believe in the Holy Ghost, in the Father, in the Son. In the Holy Ghost, in the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. But then the Lord comes to us and He looks at us one by one. He looks at how we pray. He looks at what we are asking for. He looks at our desires. He says, you know what? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast led thy first love. Verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Bring out the evidence, and bring out the result, and bring out the consequence of the first love. Turn around, repent, examine your life, Examine your commitment. Examine your testimony. And do the first works. Or else I will remove, I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent. Many of us, deep life people, have thought like the Ephesian church once were holding on to sound doctrine and once were maintaining all our regular services and once were doing everything that we know to do. We dot every I, we cross every T without remembering the first kind of love. 
that we had originally. We thought everything is all right. And now he says, I'm after the first law. I'm requesting for the first law. I want the manifestation of the first love. I'm waiting. If I don't see it, I will remove your candlestick out of its place. Look at First Timothy chapter 5. We're reading from verse 12. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 12. In verse 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Their first faith. Their first trust. Their first reliance on me. They've cast that off. Activities go on as usual. The doctrine is intact. And the Bible, the whole Bible, we carry. But it says, I realize something. When I look at your past, the faith you had, the trust you had, the confidence you had in me, and I was number one. Whenever there was any problem in the past, any challenge in the past, and you were thinking of solution, my name is the first name you remember. You had faith in me. You said God is on the throne. You said God will do it. You said God will take away my mountain. You said all my enemies who are laughing at me now, they will laugh another kind of life later because I know that Jesus is going to solve my problem. I was number one in your life. You had unwavering faith. But now, when a challenge comes, now, when a problem arises, I'm not the first one you think about. You've left your first phase. And it says, look at that verse 12, having damnation, having condemnation having judgment because they have cast off their first faith. If we're going to stand with God and we're going to please the Lord without faith, it's impossible to please Him because he that comes to God must believe that He is and He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 6. But without faith, the first faith. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, must believe. It's not a probability. It is not that I believe doctrines, I believe the Bible, I'm of deeper life, and I'm following the Lord. Everything they tell us, I'm obeying, and every program I attend, every congregation that I ought to be, I'm there. I'm a worker, I'm a leader, and I never fail. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. Not that the pastor will believe for me. That's where we're going now. Not that the prayer warriors will believe for me. That's what many people are. Everyone that comes to the Lord must believe. We must have that first faith that God is our first point of call whenever there's any problem, whenever there's a challenge, whenever there's a problem, the first thing is not to murmur. The first thing is not to complain. The first thing is not to criticize. The first thing is not to fight back. 
The first thing is not to have our way. The first thing is to look up to God because He is the author and the finisher of our faith. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not people who pay a prophet to seek God on their behalf. Not people who pay a leader to fast and pray for them and seek God for them. They keep personal contact with the Lord and each one retaining the first faith diligently seeks the Lord. The first faith and the first love for Jesus. Three things we're looking at. Number one, renewing the first faith for or in a worthy bridegroom. It's a bridegroom. It's a husband. It's a head. It's a provider. Is all in all for the church. And like a wife will have implicit trust, implicit faith in the husband, so every child of God, the bride, will have implicit faith in the bridegroom. If that trust is not there, if that confidence is not there, if that faith is not there, the heart of that wife is on another man. And the heart of that Christian is on another source of solution. If we're going to please the Lord, we must renew, we must restore, we must recover the first faith. Point number one, renewing the first faith in a worthy bridegroom. Number two, recovering the first love. Recovering the first love for of a waiting bride. A waiting bride. The husband, the bridegroom, has traveled a long distance. And all the time of the absence of the husband, the wife's heart is with him and is calling him on phone and he is calling back on phone. Christ the bridegroom has left the bride here and all the time the bridegroom is far away in a far country to receive a kingdom. The bride here, the church here is all the time talking to him all the time asking him questions all the time fellowship fellowshipping with him all the time praying unto him and all the time the bridegroom christ is sending answers back if that love weighs something is wrong if because the husband has gone on a far journey the woman, the wife, is now showing her interest on some men around here. There's something wrong. If the husband will call on the phone and she will not pick the phone, there's something wrong. If she can stay satisfied and stay contented and stay happy and stay joyful without talking to the husband far away. Something is wrong. The first love is waning, is dying down. But the Lord expects that as the first faith is there, the first love of the waiting bride must also be there. Point number three. Reflecting the first consecration of willing believers. Willing believers. 
To be willing is to reciprocate. Is to be grateful that Christ was willing to suffer, to shed his blood, to go through the agony, and to have the crown of thorns upon him, and to have the spear thrown at his side, and to nail the hand and nail the feet to the cross. And he bore that for you. He was willing before you knew him, before you knew his name, before you read the Bible, before you knew about salvation, when you were a total stranger, a total sinner, he was willing to pay the greatest price anybody can ever pay to buy a slave. And now that he has purchased you, now that he has bought you, there is something that will show your gratitude. There's something that will show that you are reciprocating his love for you. That is, you have that word willingness in your life. Willingness to consecrate like your first deed when you first knew Christ. Reflecting the first consecration of willing believers. You'll be willing. Point number one, renewing the first faith in our worthy bridegroom. I read it before. Let me read it again. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. But without faith, you may have other things, skill, ability, service. You run up and down and you try to follow the Christian religion. But whatever you do, however you run, whatever you give, your time, your talent, your money, everything you have, you even give your body to the bond without faith. It's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. It's a must. Activities will not replace faith in God. Skill will not replace faith in God. Knowledge, head knowledge will not replace faith in God. He must believe that he is. He is what he was. He is what he will ever be. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. And therefore our faith in him has not changed. He must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder. He doesn't fear God. Or slavish fear. If I get near God, He will subtract something from my life. He'll take something away from my life. He will deprive me of something. Therefore, they are afraid to yield to God. They are afraid to have implicit faith, total faith, complete faith in God. It says He must believe. That he is who he says he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. The first faith that the Lord requires from us, and he's saying he will not be happy with us if we pull back. On our faith, and we're just rendering service, empty service, faithless service, and we're doing everything we're doing, and because many of the things we do, they're also done in the world. For example, now I am preaching, it's called public speaking, they do it in the world. Now, I'm using all these gadgets 
to take my voice and bring it to you. And our faithful brethren who are making that possible. They use all these gadgets too in the world and they train themselves. We use the internet, we stream and we transfer, we transmit our messages to all the various locations. They use that in the world too and so we can use all these things and we can serve the Lord and we can render faithful service apparently unto the Lord like they do it in the world without implicit, complete, entire faith in the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 13. See the purpose of God and see the desire of the bridegroom, the desire of, the, of our husband, the desire of the head of the church, till we all come in the unity of the faith. The children who believe, the men and the women who believe, the boys and girls, the youths who believe, till we all come in the unity of the faith. To say, how can those children have faith like we have faith? Those children breathe the way we adults breathe. Those youths breathe the way adults breathe. And none of those young people will deliberately close their nose so that they will not breathe. They know that that is the very source of life. And if anything wants to stop their breathing, they say, no, no, they get out of that place. If they breathe like we breathe, if they drink water like we drink water, and if they walk like we walk, if they do exercise like we do exercise, if they do the necessary things to keep them alive in the physical, it says, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. And it says unto the measure of the fullness of the, of the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's his goal. That's what he wants. He doesn't want us to draw back and to say, I cannot have that kind of faith in God. I have too much faith in the taxi man. I have too much faith in the driver of the lorry. I have too much faith in the people that produce food from the market. I have too much faith in the people that serve me food in the restaurant. I will not question them. Whatever they give me, I have faith in them. But I cannot have that kind of faith in God. You see, he wants us to trust him implicitly. We live by faith. When you're going to the office, you know when you get to the gate, the gate will be opened. You don't doubt that. You don't think about it. And when you enter into your vehicle and your driver says he's going to take you somewhere or you tell the driver this way I'm going, you have implicit faith. And if he takes another bench, another corner to avoid the hold up, there's no suspicion. You're not jittering. You're not a, a kind of a saying, where are you going? I don't know this road. Even though you don't know that road, you trust that he, your driver, knows the road. When you trust that Jesus knows the way and that whatever way he takes, it may be new. You might not have taken that way before. You might never have known that this is the solution to this problem. But Jesus is taking that way. Like you trust human beings. Like you trust the people that are working with you and working for you. Like you trust your employees and your employers. The same way you trust the bridegroom. Consciously. Happily. And without ever saying a word of doubt, you will trust him. I will trust him. Look at verse 23 of that same chapter. And be renewed in the spirit 
of your mind and be renewed in the spirit of your mind we're talking about your mind set towards the bridegroom there are husbands and wives that once in a while they'll take time off and they will stay maybe one day maybe three days you will stay together and recollect how they loved each other at the time they first met and then they see that the coals of fire the fire of love the fervency of love is cooling down and there are ashes on their on their coal of fire and they say talking every morning talking every evening looks like it has not done it they are not doing any evil against each other they just realize that the trust without suspicion the faith without any question and the love without any inhibition that that love is going down so they take time off and they ask themselves in what way have you noticed that my love to you is not like it was in which way have you noticed that my giving you attention is not like it was when we first got married they ask those questions from one another and they recommit themselves to one another and they come out of that retreat for the family and they come back with a new understanding of trust of confidence of faith of defending each other and of love that's what the Lord is saying look at that in verse 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that in your mind Christ fills your heart Christ saturates your heart you cannot eat a meal without thinking of Christ you cannot go out of the house without thinking of Christ you cannot sit down on the seat in the office without thinking of Christ. You cannot make a projected plan without thinking of Christ. You cannot travel without asking Christ. You cannot make any decision without asking Him. You so trust Him and if what you think is good, what you think is alright, and the journey you think is proper, if Jesus says by the small, still voice in your heart that you cannot go, you shouldn't go, you'll not even ask why. The bridegroom has spoken, the husband has spoken, my king has spoken, my master has spoken, and he knows more than I know. And because of his knowledge, I trust him. That's the phase we're talking about, the first phase. The phase we had when we first came into the kingdom. It says, these other people, they have damnation because they have left their first phase. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 above all taking the shield of faith above all taking the shield of faith when you're traveling and you're traveling to a familiar place so and so is there so and so is there such and such are there Many people, they just travel. They have so much implicit faith in so and so, in such and such. They never believe that those men, those women there, they fail them. They never think about it. That those people I'm familiar with and I'm sure of that 
human weakness can come in and if it can become humanly selfish they so trust them that they don't take the faith in Christ along with them they have faith in men, they have faith in women, they have faith in familiar people. But what the Lord is saying is, don't replace me with people. No matter who they are, they're still men. We have seen children who have disappointed parents. We have seen parents of disappointed children. We have seen uh, siblings brothers and sisters of the same parents who have disappointed each other but the one that cannot disappoint that you will know that your first phase is in touch it says above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench somebody there tell me all the fiery darts of the wicked you know father and mother for those of us who still have father and mother they may be good they may be nice they may be wonderful they may want to provide everything you will ever need but you know no father no mother that you have faith in that you have confidence in that will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked there is only one person there's only one bridegroom there's only one husband there's only one lord his name is jesus faith in him will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and so it's a great mistake on our part that we lean so much on the flesh, on men and women. And because of the good and great promises, they mean well, but they cannot do all things. And if they take your heart away from Christ, that you do not have the first faith you had in Christ, you don't have that kind of faith today, you are going to get to a point where the arm of flesh will fail you. But Christ will never fail. He will not fail you. Sometimes, you know, we feel lonely. But you know why we feel lonely? Because we condition ourselves to be lonely. We rely so much on the arm of flesh. And once that arm of flesh is not there, we're lonely. Christ is there and he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Yet we're lonely. We don't recognize him that is there. He says, I will send the comforter unto you. He is with you. He will be in you forever. We still feel lonely. Even though the only ghost is there, we're not familiar with him. And Jesus said, he that hears my word and obeys my word, he it is that loves me. And I and my father will come unto him and make our abode with him. And we still feel lonely. Why? We don't have the trust, the faith, the confidence in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit like we have on a man, on a woman. Yes, there's fellowship, but the fellowship should not push God out of your life, push Christ out of your life, and put the, push the Holy Ghost out of your life, or the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost abiding with you. You will not be lonely. I will not be lonely. We appreciate the fellowship of brothers and sisters, the fellowship of husband and wife, and the fellowship of parents and children. But they shouldn't replace God if they do. We have lost our first love. You must remember 
when you became born again the first time and your closest friend didn't appreciate your being born again and your closest familiar person didn't understand you're being born again and all your life before that time you had leaned on him on her and yet you became born again the joy of the new birth the excitement of the new birth was so much that even though those people you never thought you could live a day without them when they disappointed you and they said if you are going to that kind of new faith bye bye you didn't even feel lonely you read your bible you sang from your church uh, hymn book and then you claimed the promises of god you were happy because you trusted the lord you had the first faith but now a little separation somebody frowns at you somebody says you're taking this too serious you're too obedient you're too loyal you're too faithful and if you are like that count me out of your life how lonely you feel how dejected you feel and then you go to them you're begging them don't do that you're killing me don't do that if you leave me because of my conviction i might die of absent mindedness there you are when you are first faith in christ it doesn't matter that first faith will hook you up that first faith will link you up you will be with the lord and you will remain happy and joyful because the lord is your shepherd you will not feel lonely i said you will not feel lonely you know it's that loneliness that makes us to compromise you have taken this decision during this final solution retreat and as you carry out the simple implication of your decision to a logical end the people who see that they say what's that we're not familiar with this what are you trying to do what new decision are you coming to we want to retreat together i had all the messages you heard so what's the matter with you you know when you are now tending to feel lonely they'll forsake me they will not come near me it's the loneliness that makes you to compromise that makes you to say if my decision if my consecration if my giving myself to the lord if my total yieldedness to the lord is going to separate my best friends from me and i'm going to feel lonely and dejected i change i surrender I thought I was surrendering to God, but now I surrender to them. You will not surrender your conviction. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's the first faith. That's what you want. Not partial faith partial faith will have partial contact and you know partial contact will not bring the full electricity and the light partial contact will not charge your phone partial contact will not operate that fridge partial contact is almost like no contact and when you have partial faith, partial contact with the Lord, and your whole heart is not there, your whole mind is not there, it's a partial contact, you will not realize 
the fullness of the grace of God and the supply of God like you ought to realize let us draw near of the true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience an evil conscience what's an evil conscience you know a conscience that had been conditioned a conscience that is not based on the clean clear word of god a conscience that has been so influenced by the talk 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 of the people and when you're doing the right thing and you are being led by the spirit of god and you have the chapter and verse for your action but because the people around you they influence your conscience more than the word of god influences your conscience you have evil condemnation you're taking the right decision you have condemnation you're going the right direction but somebody looks at you and he frowns at you you cannot bear that you cannot stand that somebody looks at you as you're walking walking by faith not walking by sight and you're walking by the word of god and this person he doesn't even talk she doesn't even talk and she looks at you like this it sends an arrow into your heart confusion comes am i wrong Am I right? I thought I was right. I prayed and I was led of God to take this decision. But so and so is not happy with me. So and so is not comfortable with me. Because of that, it goes right into your conscience. Your conscience had been infiltrated by ideas of people. Your conscience is not standing on the word of God alone. You are a man of indecision, a woman of indecision. You cannot take a stand and you cannot say, this is where I stand. Once a little persecution and a little reaction comes to what decision you are taking, your conscience is ruffled. And it's because you don't have implicit faith and total faith in Christ, the King, the Master, the Lord, the Bridegroom. Your faith is in the arm of flesh. We love people, but we don't surrender our souls to them. We appreciate people, many good people, all of us children of God, good, good people, useful people, profitable people. And we can almost say, how can we live without them? Yet, as good as they are, we don't surrender our eternal destiny into the hands of anyone. That's why it says now, let's have a conscience washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. Let us live let us hold fast the profession of our faith since you came to this retreat the lord has led you deeper into faith higher into faith you have cried you have wept you have prayed you have shouted you have said lord this is a new realm i thank you for bringing me to this retreat now i'm going to go out of this place with new strength and new energy may it happen your life in jesus name now let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised the lord will not disappoint you is faithful when you are alone is faithful you will not be lonely you're not seeing that christ is not in all you're not seeing that god is not in all it will be sufficient for you every day of your life in jesus name 
point number two recovering the first love of a waiting bride recovering the first love of a waiting bride we are the bride we are the children of god and we're waiting we're waiting for his coming it tells us in first thessalonians chapter one first thessalonians chapter one i'm reading here from verse nine for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Look at verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven is the bridegroom. We are the bride. Is gone to a far country to receive the kingdom. And now we're waiting for him, the waiting bride whom he raised Jesus the bridegroom that he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come think about what Christ has done to deliver us from the wrath to come what's that? from hell from an eternity of suffering even if he doesn't do any other thing for us except that our names are now in the book of life. He is preparing a place for us in heaven. And he, is, he has removed us from the wrath to come, delivered us. And now we know that the gate of hell is closed and we are not going to go to hell. Even if that is the only thing he has done, we ought to love him. How grateful are you when you are suffering, terrible pain, and you are about dying, and then a good, effective medical doctor came around and he gave you something to drink, something to swallow. And within a few minutes, all the pain went down. You couldn't sleep before, and within a few minutes, you went to sleep. You woke up in the morning, and you were sound, you were healthy, you were happy, everything was all right. You didn't have appetite before, but now you have appetite. You are so grateful to that doctor. You almost want to idolize him. You love him. You love him. Because see what he has done. See what Christ has done. That he has delivered you from an eternity of suffering, an eternity of agony. How much we ought to love him. The first love. The first love. Well, the first love, John chapter 21. John chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 15. John 21, reading from verse 15. So, when they had died, Jesus says unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these fishermen? Now you've got, come back to the riverside. As I told you earlier, I told you now, put your net there and you have caught all these big fish. And you are counting 153. Is that where your love is, Simon? Lovest thou me more than business? Lovest thou me more than prosperity? Lovest thou me more than marketing? Lovest thou me more than property? Lovest thou me more than gain? More than profit? Lovest thou me more than the material things of the world that the first love 
a request from you, request from me. Can you look around you and see all the things you have? Where do you put your love? Your heart, a new car, that new car has taken quiet time away from you. You're nursing it, you're washing it, you're cleaning it, you're putting engine oil, you're opening the carburetor, you're opening this and opening that, my car, my car. And if anything splashes on it, you almost go mad. When people abuse the name of Jesus, insult the name of Jesus, and they write dirty, dirty things about Jesus, and you see it on the internet, by mistake, you just say, look at these people. Look at the way they are talking about Jesus. But when they splash little mud on your car, you don't take it that easy. Lovest thou me more than that? Lovest thou me more than land? Lovest thou me more than property? You've got a certificate, thank God. You made a good grade, thank God. But now, everybody you see around, whatever the conversation, you want to talk and tailor the conversation to the point you will have the chance you know something? I just got a new certificate, a new degree, and I've been waiting for this for a long time. And now I've got it. If you have chance, let me just run to where I put it. I want to show you. It's the idol of my life. You don't talk about Jesus that way. How many people do you pass? How many people do you contact? And you never talk about Jesus? The certificate is more exciting and more interesting. And the Lord is saying, I'm waiting for the first love. I'm waiting for the primary love. I'm waiting for that high love. Lovest thou me more than these? The Lord will give us a greater love. Uh, look at Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. We're reading here from chapter 8. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is stronger, is as strong as death. And then it goes on to say, The coals thereof are coals of fire, which has a most vehement heat of flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Many waters cannot quench love. Many waters cannot quench love. When you love, somebody the house is not too far away when you love somebody the hold up and the traffic jam on the way does not stop you from going to them whatever the challenge whatever the difficulty the person you love is waiting for you sometimes there's even danger on the way and you are reading about it and you are hearing about it on that road, on that way, there is danger. And somebody went through that place and look at what happened. You just believe that it will not happen to you because you must go and see that man. You must go and see that lady whom your heart loves very well. Coals of fire and the water will not, the water will not quench the fervency of love. But let there be a little hold up to go to the Bible study. I would have gone, but you know, the hold up. I've not seen it, but I heard. 
even on Sunday, I would have gone to worship the Lord. That's my church. But I have to stay at home today. You know why? I'm not feeling too nice. I'm not feeling too well. When you felt like that, and you were to go visit your fiancé, you still wait. You love human beings more than Christ. You love fiancé more than Christ. We're on honeymoon. I we going to go here and go there. But there's no money. Look at the economy. Are you going to spend all the money you have on honeymoon? Well, God will provide after we have spent the money. But now you cannot put enough money into transportation and go to church and go for Bible study and go for revival hour. You know why? The first love is not there. May the Lord restore the first love in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Yeah. You will love him more. Yeah. You will love him more. Yeah. Do you remember if you're married after you're you know, done a whole day? Heavy work in the day. Great work in the day. Tiring work in the day. And we will expect that the next thing you should do now, just go and sleep. You deserve it. But then uh, you are in courtship with a lady, a sister, in courtship with a man, a brother. You are dog tired. And you couldn't attain to any other thing. But now you said, I've not spoken to her today. I've not spoken to him today. And then you pick up the phone. You said, you know, I would have come to you right now. But at least before I sleep, I must hear your voice. And she also replied on the other side. Me too, me too. I was waiting for your call. Even though you were tired. Do you remember how often we miss talking to Christ? We're tired. Do you remember how often uh, we miss a quiet time? We're tired. Do you remember how often we miss fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? We're tired. That's the first love he's talking about. He says, I know you. There's something you say, I don't know how to love. Don't say that again. You know how to love. I about loving uh, that sister. Dreaming about that sister, thinking about that sister, writing to that sister. You know, I don't know how to write, but to write to her. Not something bad, just because you love each other. Now, you can do that to Christ too. Love him. You will love him. I love Jesus Christ. I said I love Jesus Christ. Those who don't understand me, persecute me for loving the bridegroom. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. The Lord will help you. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading here from verse 35. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35. In verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Look at verse 39. No height, no depth, no any creature, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord who will separate you from Christ I'm asking a question who will separate you from Christ any man any woman landed property house certificate 
extramoral studies, nothing will separate you from Christ. When we're loving, when we're appreciating, when we hold on to Him, when we love Him above everyone on earth, we love Him above every sin on earth, nothing will be able to separate us from the Lord. Look at First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, verse 19. In First John chapter 4, verse 19, we love Him because He first loved us. Make it personal. Everybody wants to throw go. I love Him because He first loved me. Look at Jesus. At His page, the greatest price that could be paid is now in heaven. Praying, interceding for you. Can you think of Christ in heaven with all those angels, with the Heavenly Father, with the Holy Spirit, with the streets of gold, with the great mansions there, with Moses and Elijah, and with Elisha and David, and with all those people in heaven, with Peter, with John, with James, Matthew, everybody, and yet with all the saints surrounding him, all the angels surrounding him, he still remembers you here on earth. He loves you. You must love him. I love him. I love him. I will go any journey for him. I love him. I will do any work for him. I love him. I will endure any pain for him. I love him. I will go through any persecution for him because I love him. You will love him. Point number three, reflecting the first consecration of willing believers. Willing believers. When somebody is willing, you don't have to pressurize him or her. You don't have to announce and announce and motivate and motivate when somebody is willing. You don't have to give carrot incentive for him to do what he ought to do when there's willingness. You don't have to threaten and show the whip. If you don't do it, this is what will happen. We don't need all that when there's willingness. And believers must be willing. We don't have to, you know, read that verse every time. Obey them that have the rule over you and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. When we're willing, thank God we're willing. My brother, I said you are willing. My sister, I said you are willing. Look at Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm reading from verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit down, sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule over, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Look at verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Are the people of God here tonight? The children of God, are we here tonight? The people of God, the children of God shall be willing in the day of thy power. This is the day, this is the day of the power of God. That power will heal you. 
That power will deliver you. That power will lift you up. That power will promote you. That power will move every mountain in your life. If this is the day of his power, and we are beneficiaries of the power of the Lord, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. I am willing. I said, I am willing. One minister was asking me, what do you do? How many meetings do you have? Oh, I said, not too many. I have workers training on Saturday. I have Sunday worship. I have Monday Bible study. I have Tuesday. I do that regularly every week. And then when there is chance, I go to the state. I go different places to evangelize and to hold crusade. He said, you are doing all that at this age now? Are you not um, going to slow down? I said, I didn't think about that. I didn't think there's any slowing down. You know why? I am willing in the day of his power. Power will come in your life. Authority will come in your life. The work you should have done many years ago, but you didn't have the power. Now, your day has come. With the new strength, and with the new provision, and with the new power, this is the time to rise up and move on in the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That's why this is not the time to look back. This is not the time to close your eyes. This is not the time to sleep. This is not the time to say, I am above 70, I am above 80, I want to retire now. You cannot retire now. The power has just come. All your years, let's say you didn't have a good motor car, a good vehicle, and now you're 70, now you're 80, and somebody bought the best car in town, and he gave it to you, and he appointed a driver, and gave that driver to you, and then he cleared everything, and he says, when you want to service the car, don't spend your money, I have reserved, I'm going to give you everything. Uh, even though you are now old, you are 80, or you are going to 90, you cannot say, can I ride any car now? You will ride the car. Power. 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 I rejoice with you. This is the day of power in your life. You will climb mountains. You will cross rivers. You will evangelize. The power of God will work mightily in your life. Satan will see you and run. Demons will see you and run. Evil powers, when they hear your name connected with the name of Jesus, they will take the baton, they will run. You are strong. I said you are strong. This is the day of his power and the people of God shall be willing. Am I willing? I said, are you willing? Something good is waiting for you. Look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. The best of provision in this land is yours. The best of success on this land is yours. The best of position in this church is yours. And the best of opportunities in life is yours. If you be willing and obedient, there's no the time to sleep, there's no time to wake up and be willing. Anybody as willing as I am? I said anybody as willing as I am? 
I'm willing to run anybody there. I'm willing to evangelize anybody there. I'm willing to supply the needs of the church anybody there. I'm willing to pay tithes and offering anybody there. I'm willing to sell myself for the propagation of the gospel. Anybody there? Let the willing brothers and sisters rise up and tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I recover back my first faith. I recover back my first love. I will not be sleeping again. I will not be sluggish again. I will not be looking back anymore. I am willing. I am willing. I am willing. Whatever assignment, I am willing. Whatever journey, I am willing. Whatever duty, I am willing. Willing. If you are willing, tell the Lord. It's the day of His power. It's the day of anointing. It's the day of breaking yoke. It's the day of doing exploits for the Lord. And the people shall be willing. My brother, tell the Lord how willing you are. Tell the Lord, my sister, how willing you are. Don't talk about age. Don't talk about tiredness. It's the day of His power. You will not be tired. You will not be weary. You will not faint. It's the day of His power. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Any cage around you, any prison around you, let all those walls of your cage, of your prison, be broken down. Be willing. Be willing. There's work to do. There's work to do. Why are you not a worker? And there is uh, money to be spent. Why are you not giving? Be willing. Be willing. God will surprise you. Miracles will be flowing in your life, in your family. God will surprise you. Mountains will move. Demons will flee. Sicknesses will flee away. Be willing. Be willing. Be willing. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And if you be willing and obedient, he shall eat the good of the land. The good of the land is waiting for you. The best of the land is waiting for you. The best of progress is waiting for you. The best of success is waiting for you. Be willing. Be willing. Be willing. Don't draw back. Don't step back. Don't say I'm tired. Look at the few people that are doing the great work that ought to be done. It's the day of His power. Come out and tell the Lord, I'm here. I will serve. I will walk. I am willing. Hold up. That will be, not be an excuse. Traffic jam. That will not be an excuse. Money for transportation to come to workers' meeting. Money for transportation to come to Monday Bible study or to come to Sunday service. That will not be a challenge. I am willing. I am willing. I am willing. We need people to lead us fellowship. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I am willing. We need people to sing in the choir. And we need people to learn musical instruments. I am willing. We need full-time workers in various areas. I am willing. The people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. You will not suffer. You will not suffer. The Lord will see to it that He blesses your willingness. Be willing, Lord, I'm willing. First love, dust up that love. All the ashes on the coals of fire, blow them all. Willingness to have first faith.
first confidence, first trust, first reliance, first assurance in the Lord. Why should I doubt the Lord? Have unwavering faith. Unwavering faith. First faith. First faith. First love. Loving Him with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your skill, all your mind, all your might. Love Him. Love Him. He first loved us. Love Him. Love Him. Above anything, above anyone on earth. Love Him. And tell Him, when you love your wife, you tell your wife, I love you. You love your husband, you tell your husband, I love you. Tell the bridegroom, tell the Lord, I love you. With my heart, with my soul, I love you. With my property, I love you. With my talent, I love you. I love your work. I love your word. I love your ministry. I love your children. I love everything about you. I love you. Persecution does not cancel my love. Misunderstanding will not cancel my love. Tell him I love you. I believe in you. I have faith in you. I never look in any other direction. I believe you. I trust you. And I'm willing to do anything, everything for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. How many have recovered the first love? Where are you? And the first faith? Where are you? And now you are willing. The Lord will bless you beyond your expectation. The good of the land will flow into your house. And everything you ought to have your loving God, your believing in God, your willingness to serve the Lord with all your strength. No good sin will be withheld from you. He will take care of you. Even the people of the world, they'll become jealous of you. Anyone there that loves the Lord, where is he? Where is she? Having faith in God, first faith, where is she? Where is she? Willing, willing, willing to serve. Where is she? Where is she? Father, we thank you tonight. We come to renew our faith, our love, our zeal, our consecration, our willingness on the altar of prayer. We're asking, O oh Lord, receive everything we have come to give in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, we will run errands for you. We will do your work. We will manifest practical love towards you in Jesus' name. As you have promised, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I pray every heart, every house, every family will be filled to overflowing in Jesus' name. The health to serve the Lord, the strength to serve the Lord, the power to serve the Lord. 
receive it in Jesus' name. Every need of your life supplied. Every mountain in your life moved away. Anything that will hinder you, impede your progress, anything that will stop you, Lord, take it away in Jesus' name. Your people will not faint. Your people will not be weary. Everyone, everyone, everyone is going into the new year with new strength. And Lord, I pray that great things, wonderful things, uncountable blessings will be the Lord of everyone in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to maintain the first faith, maintain the first love, and maintain our willingness. Lord, I pray that in my lifetime I'll see every one of your people on the mountain top. Anything that has made them to be in the valley, anyone and everyone, Lord, remove them from that valley. Take everyone up. Lead everyone up. Raise everyone up to the mountain top you will be happy all the days of your life confirm it Lord in every life in Jesus name I pray